all for coming uh, to today's uh, Magnet Seminar. This is the uh, fifth in our series, so we're going strong and we've had some uh, fantastic support from our community, so uh, thank you all very much. Um, today we will have uh, Cathy Whaler uh, from the University of Edinburgh talking to us about the uh, 2016 Pacific Jerk and core mantle boundary flows derived from uh, swarm data. Um, but before we begin that, just a, a quick rundown for those of you who haven't attended one of these seminars. Um, our presentations will be about uh, 20 to 20, uh, 25 to 30 minutes long. And I kindly ask that you keep your uh, microphones muted so that background noise, such as babies screaming and crying, uh, doesn't interrupt uh, the seminar. Um, at the end of the, the presentation, we will have uh, 10 to 15 minutes for uh, questions. Uh, you can raise your hand via Zoom uh, and we can, we'll invite you to unmute and ask your question. If you don't want to uh, ask an oral question, please just type it into the uh, Zoom chat um, and add the no mic uh, quote to it. Uh, and then either myself or one of my co-hosts will uh, read out the question uh, for you. Um, and as usual, we're always busy, so um, please just uh, leave if you have to. Uh, we all have life going on in the background. And at the end of the seminar, um, we will have a small chance to catch up and, and socialise with everybody. And I should state that at the end of the seminar, when we have this little networking, socialising, uh, the recording will be stopped. So it's only the seminar and the um, question and answer session uh, that will be recorded. Um, and so without uh, further ado, I will hand over to our uh, presenter for today, which is Cathy Whaler from the University of Edinburgh. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, I'm hoping I'm sharing my screen now. And you can see my presentation, is that right? Uh, not at the moment. Right. Um, share screen. Aha. Let's try this one. Is that any better? Yeah, that's, that's perfect. You can see your screen now. Okay, right. First of all, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. Secondly, this is really just um, a brief update to a presentation that I gave at the virtual EGU meeting. So apologies to those of you who uh, were present at that. And just one other small update. Um, I'm informed my, my co-authors that the jerk is actually very specifically in 2017. So I've just changed that uh, date from 2016 that was in the abstract to 2017 here. So, uh, let's see if I can, there we go, outline. I'm just going to cover where we got to for, to be at this point um, in, in the research. I'll talk a little bit about the data, then I'll talk about the inversions that I did to obtain core surface flows in terms of the models and how well they fit the data. And then I'll move on specifically to the Pacific jerk before concluding. And just to say that this is uh, really quite a nice um, uh, and, I mean, related to the very first talk in this series by Chris Davis, when he was looking at very rapid changes in field direction and looking at the field dynamics itself. And I'm going to do something slightly different, look at all three components of the magnetic field from current observations and think about the core surface flow that might explain them. So what I'm going to use is virtual observatories or VOs and these are a way of reducing large quantities of satellite data to estimates of magnetic field quantities at a set of target points and as a function of time. So what we're trying to do by this process is to mimic the time series that you obtain from ground observatories. So what one uses to produce a VO estimate are data within a vertical cylinder whose axis passes through the target point and then those data are reduced to values at the target point using a potential representation, a local uh, potential representation. I'm not going to go into any of the details of that here um, but just to co comment that the DTU group, my co-authors, have made several key improvements to the VO methodology 
This includes, and this is going to be the focus today, producing spatial gradients of the field in addition to the magnetic field and time derivatives of both the field and the field gradients. So uh, previously I've demonstrated the, the surface SV gradient as well as the SV VO estimates can be used to infer core surface flow and uh, shown that the residuals are less biased, including, in, sorry, indicating less contamination of the data by external fields. This was uh, definitely a problem with some of the earlier VO estimates. And by doing a lot of work, the DTU group have overcome a lot of those um, issues. And I've shown that the resolution is better for gradient data. So I will show um, that we can use these gradient data to produce the core surface flow. And I, will, I have got a slide to show about the resolution, but I'm not going to talk today about the residuals because of um, lack of time. So um, these BO estimates are derived from sums and differences of the observations along and across track from the satellite data. And they're reduced to a um, central point using a cubic potential description, which is one of the enhancements that DTU group have um, made. And rather than producing monthly values, which is what we typically get from observatories, they're, using, uh, they're producing four monthly values so that each virtual observatory volume is well sampled so we don't have biases from the satellite orbits during the period that's being studied. And then simple annual differences of the field estimates provide secular variation estimates. And alongside all of this process, you can get uh, reliable uncertainties. So the inversions that I've been done are going, uh, I've done are going to be weighted by the uncertainties. And the optimum arrangement of VOs turns out to be something like 300. So I'm going to be using 300 equally spaced VOs. And in fact, I'm going to be using 298 because we don't use gradients from the polar um, positions. And then the search range, i.e. The, the diameter of those cylinders is 700 kilometers. And the corrections that have also helped with improving these estimates is to remove the crustal field remove the external and its induced uh, field and reduce, um, remove the ionospheric plus its induced field estimate as well as part of the processing chain. And here is an example from these 300 virtual observatories of one of the secular variation gradient time series. So this is the time derivative of the radial component in the radial direction and you'll be seeing the other five independent components later on. So the red dots on the screen here are the positions, of the virtual observatories. They don't look equally spaced here, but that's just the projection that's been chosen. And the blue dots, either side of those red dots, are the time series. So you can see the kind of variation. And then in the bottom left here is the um, scale. So this is 20 picoteslas per kilometer. Per year. And the time span is 2014 to about 20, uh, 2019. Okay. Um, and as I said, these are four monthly estimates. And the black ellipse here, we're going to be looking at the fits to the data at this virtual observatory a little bit later on. So um, the 2017 Pacific Jerk. Um, I should have pointed this out, of course. You can see that there's really quite a sudden change in this particular component in the Pacific region at about the middle of that time series, which means it is about 2017. Okay, And you can also see that in the secular variation data themselves. So here, data from Honolulu Observatory, the radial, the north-south and the east-west component of the magnetic field there, or sorry, the secular variation there. So now in nanoteslas per year. And again, you can see this very sudden change in around 2017, um, certainly in these two components and to some extent also into the, in the phi component as well as the secular variation. So this is a, a locally um, well-defined feature. And I'm showing just the observatory data here, but you can also see in the secular variation VO data as well. So what kind of flows do we need to explain these changes? The way we do this is we assume the magnetic field is frozen into the fluid at the top of the outer core. That means that we're assuming 
magnetic diffusion is negligible and as a result the field lines track the flow which I've tried to illustrate in this little slide so we've got two times t1 here and t2 here this black line here is the core mantle boundary and we're looking at a cross section through it so here's the outer liquid outer core and here's the mantle above and these red and blue lines here are the field lines that thread the core mantle boundary so here the field is leaving the core here it's entering the core and i've imagined a flow pattern underneath so because uh, field lines are tied to the parcels of fluid um, on the core side as the fluid moves it drags the field lines along with it so if we've got a simple flow like this it's just going to move the pattern around so it's going to drift the pattern between time t1 and time t2 uh, in the lower half here we've got a, a different kind of scenario where I'm imagining converging flow at the core surface and that results then by dragging the field lines together in a local field intensification. So this is the idea behind uh, using the advective flow assumption to derive the core surface flow. So the equation that derives that is here, so it says the rate of change of the field on the secular variation, beg your pardon, too many clicks um, is an interaction between the flow acting on the field. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the radial component of this equation here at the core surface, treat it as an inverse problem for the flow, which has no radial component at the core surface because it's a material boundary. So we're going to look at the north, south and the east, west components. And we're going to derive them from the secular variation, but in fact, we're going to derive them from the spatial gradients of the secular variation at those satellite virtual observatories. And we assume within this process that the main field is perfectly known, and I've just chosen to specify it by the chaos model at the time instant each time. And I'm going to get a time series of the flow by minimizing the temporal and the spatial complexity of the flow. And I'll talk a little bit about that, more about that later on. So what we actually do is we expand everything, the field itself, the secular variation and potentials representing the flow in terms of spherical harmonics. And that allows us to seek solutions for the coefficients of these potential expansions of the flow, which are linearly related to the secular variation or the secular variation gradient data. So I said a little bit more about, I said earlier, we're going to minimize the spatial and the temporal complexity of the flow. So the way we do that, or regularizing it, is we minimize the epoch to epoch flow changes in each of our flow coefficients, and either minimize one of these three measures of the spatial complexity of the flow. So the first choice, possible choice is to look, minimize the kinetic energy. The second is what's become known these days as the strong norm. We're going to minimize the root mean square second spatial derivatives, and I'm not going to be more explicit than that. And the third choice, this was um, a regularization I derived when I first started looking at flows for a completely different reason. But um, what we can do is say, right, I would like to minimize the amount of secular variation that the flow generates when it interacts with the field. So what I've actually chosen to is in fact to minimize the root mean square radial secular variation. So three really quite different measures of spatial complexity. But what I hope to convince you of by the end of the talk is that they each require the same kind of flow accelerations to fit the data. And in particular to explain that Pacific jerk. So um, very quickly moving on to the results. I was able to obtain a minimum normalized misfit of 1.2 and the flows presented here had that value. So obviously that's slightly above the optimum value of one, but remember that we are neglecting diffusion and so on and so forth. So I was fairly content with a, a normalized misfit of 1.2. Now I'm going to show you a movie of the flow globally in a moment. It shows the usual features such as a band of westward flow beneath the, Pacific, the Atlantic Ocean, slower flow beneath the Pacific Ocean because in general secular variation is uh, weaker there, and the eccentric planetary gyre. And what you'll see is that few globally, very little flow changes are required to achieve this misfit over the um, five years or so of swarm data that I've looked at. 
So here is the flow, and uh, this was actually obtained with the minimizing the kinetic energy in the flow. And just to give you an idea of the scale, the root mean square um, flow speed is about eight kilometers per year. So here's the eccentric planetary gyre. Here's the band of westward flow in this sort of western hemisphere, the hemisphere centered on Greenwich longitude. And here is the lower, much weaker flow, slower flow in the Pacific hemisphere. And this is the rather boring movie that whoops that results from that. I'll just play it one more time. Okay, but we'll see later when we home in on the Pacific that there is a little bit more detail to be seen there. Okay, so before I do that, I'll show you how well these data fit, um, how they, well these models predict the data. So we're going to look at the six independent gradient components at that virtual observatory I um, marked with the black ellipse earlier and look at the predictions by the three flows that um, using that, those three different spatial regularizations. And again, units pico teslas per kilometer per year. Vertical scales you'll see vary from plot to plot. Okay. Now the predictions of the differently spatially regularized solutions feel fit equally well globally, but they differ a little as you'll see at the virtual observatory location. And you'll also note that regularized flows under predict the amplitude of the signal slightly and relaxing regularization doesn't help in any substantial fashion. So this is the component we were looking at before in the top right, the RR component of secular variation. Um, again, to 2014 to 2019, the blue dots here are the data themselves. And then the three curves in orange, gray and yellow are the predictions of those three different spatial complexity norms. So this is the strong norm, the strongest regularization, the kinetic energy norm, we've just seen the flow for that, and the radial second elevation norm, which I'll also show you flows for later. Okay. So you can see that we're following the, the trends in general. As I say here, here, for example, you can see how we're under predicting the amplitudes. This scale is here is a little bit smaller, but then you'll see these are rather scattered data as well. Um, and here is another example of where we're under predicting the data. But those three flows do roughly equal jobs of fitting the data. So I hope you can believe that globally they fit to you know, the same extent. Okay, so let's look at the Pacific jerk in 2017. And I'll try to convince you that there's a localized increase in eastward flow speed, particularly in the western part of the Pacific north of the equator and there's a westward acceleration south of the equator. And that these flow changes are insensitive to the form of spatial regularization. The flows themselves are really quite different. So I was quite stunned when I found that the changes themselves are very, very similar. So this is the Pacific region here. Um, and this is the strong norm flow. And again, I'm going to show you a video. I've put lots more arrows on here to look at this small region. And I hope if I play it again, you'll see how this eastward flow here is intensifying at around jerk speed time. Okay. There are some other notable changes over this side as well. But to explain the Pacific uh, jerk you know, in this region, um, we're probably looking at these kind of features here. I'll play it one more time, there we are. Okay, so that's really quite a pronounced feature. Now these are the flows for different spatial regularizations. I've just chosen one epoch from within that. You've seen how little temporal variability there is. So this is the kinetic energy norm. This is the strong norm, so you'll see that we're more strongly regularized, so we're allowing less spatial structure than within the kinetic, with the kinetic energy norm. And this has got a, a reference vector on which applies to all three. And this is the flow that minimizes is the amount of radial secular variation when it acts on the magnetic field. And you'll see it's quite a bit stronger. Um, certainly there's no real sense of weaker, uh, slower flow beneath the Pacific. Um, in general, although there are some places where that's true. And the, the eccentric gyre is, is less well-defined, I would say. And there are some other really quite strange, um, rapid, uh, sorry, small-scale upwellings and downwellings. So I'm not suggesting that that's necessarily a physically realistic flow, 
but it's again one that fits the data and we will get we will see shortly that the changes that we need to explain the data with this flow are the same essentially as with these two flows as well okay so I, the way i'm going to try and show you that is by calculating the acceleration and i've just done that as successive flow differences so i've, take, I've subtracted um, the epoch before from a given epoch and use that to define the acceleration and i've not done any smoothing or anything like that and you can also see these same kind of differences these um, uh, features if we look at the differences from the mean and i do have videos of those at the end and they're slightly less noisy than the acceleration as you can imagine okay so here's the flow acceleration for the strong uh, i apologize the scale vector is uh, factor three too large which you, you can't really see it very well anyway so i'm going to play this movie okay and you can see around the jerk time this Start, this feature starts to show this eastward acceleration and in fact there's a counterbalancing um, westward acceleration to the um, slightly off to the southwest and these features also seem to be robust between the three different wave flow regularizations I've chosen so I'll play this one more time okay we'll see some other circulations gyres um, in the acceleration sharp here as well as we as we go through the time sequence so that's the strong norm Here's the kinetic energy norm. You'll see there's slightly more energy in uh, converging and diverging accelerations, which is slightly dif difficult to get your head around, but never mind. And again, we see at the end an eastward acceleration here, westward acceleration here, southwestward um, here, northeastward here, as we saw in the last one, with some other features that are consistent in between, but it's hard to stop the video reliably to, to show you those. And finally, the, um, the norm that produces a slightly strange flow uh, that minimizes the amount of predicted secular variation. And again, you'll see the snapshot here showing a very similar feature uh, um, acceleration at the start. And as we go through, very similar acceleration at the end, southwestward here, northeastward here, eastward and westward there. So I would claim that we've um, identified features of the flow or changes in the flow that are required to fit those secular variation gradient data. So we've produced satisfactory flow models derived only from the gradient data. I haven't put any actual secular variation data in themselves. As we've seen globally, very little flow change is required. Um, to start, uh, these temporally and spatially regularized flows slightly under predict the jet amplitude in these uh, gradient data and that's certainly an experience I've had before uh, where they, they under predict secular variation data themselves and what we've seen I hope is that 2017 jerk involves an eastward flow acceleration in the central pacific near the equator and I will stop there thank you. Thank you very much Kathy. Um, so we can all give Kathy a, a virtual uh, applause uh, through Zoom. It was a really uh, interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I will open the floor now to um, anybody with some questions for Kathy. Well, I guess I'll kick off uh, the questions. Um, when you're looking at the the um, different regularizations, you know, you're seeing very different, um, glo well, globally speaking, you're seeing very different flow patterns. Um, are there any consistent features other than what you're looking at in the Pacific that, that, that would be robust features in these different uh, models? Um, let me go back to showing my screen and... Um, so, you know how they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder and all that. So, uh, uh, I mean, I would say that the gyre is identifiable in all three. So here's this uh, Pacific gyre. This is the enhanced feature in the um, sort of above the Bering Strait at the core mental boundary that uh, Phil Livermore's looked at with Chris Finley from Swarm Data down here round back up again. They've all got a band of westward flow across the hemisphere centered on Greenwich 
here, a little bit less obvious. And the gyre is kind of a little bit different in this case, but uh, I suspect if you filter that flow, just to look at the spherical harmonics that were most representative of the gyre, you would see those same features. Um, I haven't looked at a compa comparison between the power spectra to see if there are any sort of shapes that are similar there, but um, you, can, you can identify some features that seem to be consistent. I mean, there's another one here would be this small um, eddy, okay, less well resolved here because of the um, increased um, damping or regularization of small scale features. So um, there are some features that are similar, but it's perhaps harder to um, identify them, particularly in this play. Thank you. Um, and so Cassie has, uh, Cap Constable has a, a question. Yeah, uh, I have to confess, I'm a little con uh, struck by the fact that. Uh, the jerk occurs in the place where the secular variation is weakest. And um, I'm wondering if this is telling us something about uh, changes that are coming in the Pacific Hemisphere, potentially. I, I would have thought there's a good chance that it is, yes. Um, I mean, it's certainly, maybe I should have prepared a slide also of the virtual observatories throughout the region because obviously people were arguing, oh, well, you don't see the changes because we've only got a few spots where we can actually measure the field at the observatories. But once you do look throughout the whole of the Pacific using virtual observatories, you do see very, very consistent features in general, as you say, low secular variation, but now this, the, certainly this well-defined jerk seen first in Honolulu, but certainly throughout that local area, very well resolved in the virtual observatory data. So yes, I, I'm sure that it is telling us something about that. Okay, thanks. Do you have uh, any further questions for Cathy? So I guess I have a, a, a question. I don't know if you have seen it. Um, there was a recent paper in Nature Geoscience, which was inferring um, high, conducti high conductivity mantle under the Pacific, which is explaining this low secular variation. Given the fact that we see a jerk, uh, what does that suggest then about the conductivity in, uh, of the mantle in that region? Um, the simple answer to that question would be, you know, that, that I mean, uh, conductivity will screen out the changes, will stop them propagating through. But um, as George Backus showed back in, what's it, 83, you can get a, a combination of field changes um, that, that will propagate and be seen as a, as a rapid change, a jerk-like feature at the surface, regardless of the actual conductivity of the mantle. And in particular, um, there's very little screening if your conductivity is um, concentrated close to the, uh, the core mental boundary in D double prime, for instance, then the screening is, is very much weaker. And I think that tends to be where people want to put high conductivity, you know, with things like post proskite and iron in the lower mantle. So it, it's not a barrier to having rapid circulation at the, the surface. We've got some, a little bit of time for any more comments or questions. I see uh, Richard Holm waving his hand. Hey, Cathy. Um, Hi, Richard. So I was struck by your vertical virtual observatories by just how sharp these features are in the data. And these features are not measurements of secular variation. They are annual averages, in effect, of what the real secular variation is and yet they're very, very sharp. Now, you can't invert them directly, and I've been just trying to do some, this is related to the stuff I did on rotation a few years ago. Um, you can't invert them directly, but you can come up with some kind of ideas, and the field changes don't just have to be sharp. They have to, the second version has to jump in order to get the average coming out as of such a sharp V-shape. Remember, it's not an average, it's just two annual differences. It's two it's annual fair. differences of values. 
Yes, but then exactly. That is, that is the equivalent of, if you're trying to plot secular variation, that's the equivalent of an annual, annual mean. Yeah, yeah, it's close to an annual really mean, is. yes. And, and then if you have these really sharp changes, mm. that's quite a strong change. Yeah. I mean, this, this is a, a problem we've been looking at for ages, but just your data are quite so sharp. And of course, your flows don't come uh, close the to the DTU's that, that data, shot. not mine. I've just been inverting them. But your yeah. group's data, thank you. <laughs> your, your talk's data. I, I will, <laughs> right. Unless Niels wants to argue with me, he was, he was around <laughs> here somewhere. Um, but nonetheless, these things are very, very sharp when mm. you think mm -hmm. about how they're constructed in terms of first differences. Um, any yeah. thoughts on that? No, um, and that's one of the things that the DTU group are looking at in terms of their, um, their virtual observatory calculations so that they've been producing these as part of the swarm disk um, enterprise as it were so they've looked at uh, and, and clearly what you get is um, a spatial temporal trade-off so you can make smaller VO you know you can average over a smaller area if you're willing to take longer times or if you want a shorter time scale then you need to take a bigger volume to get a meaningful average. So there's, there's some kind of trade-off there. Uh, and so you could optimize to look at the temporal variability, I suspect. Mm. But even, By, without, even without doing it, they are very, very sharp. They're, they're pretty sharp, yeah. And um, I haven't, you know, what I should, should have done and um, what we've been encouraging the DTU group is to put on the error bars as well. So as I mentioned, they've calculated um, variances of each of those data points. So you can actually see that they, they are well resolved within, you know, them, th those are bigger changes than the uncertainties. Well, me being me, I don't worry too much about error bounds, but the fact that they show up so consistently looking like that, mm. there's, no, there's something there. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you but I can't offer any further insight, I'm afraid. Cool, thank you. Um, we can have time to squeeze in uh, one more question, if anybody has one. No, I guess not. Um, so thank you very much, Cathy. That was a, a, a really uh, interesting talk and a lot of uh, valuable and interesting questions there. So, um, everyone would like to thank Cathy once again for, for her talk. Um, before we all disappear, um, I would just like to, to, to uh, make a quick announcement for the uh, upcoming seminars uh, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, so in two weeks, on August 12th, we have uh, Courtney Sprain from University of Florida uh, giving us a presentation. Um, but as we come to the end of summer, we still have some, some open slots. So if anybody is interested in uh, giving a presentation, please um, uh, get in touch with us and we can schedule something up for you in the coming weeks. Um, and as always, uh, feedback, uh, thoughts, ideas and criticisms, criticisms are always very welcome for these seminars. So uh, just drop us an email if you have any suggestions there. And thank you all again for uh, coming out for another uh, successful uh, Magnet seminar. So thank you.